Welcome to the Unscripted Authentic Leadership Podcast, a podcast where we're seeking to lead change while also seeking to understand. We're also here as a platform for leaders to come together to unite to develop and empower other leaders in the areas of business, family, and community. I'm your host, Lafayette Lane, joined by my co host, John LeBron. And today we are joined by our special guest, Coach Gary Waters. Put those hands together, put those clappy boys in the comment <laughs> section. Make Coach feel right at home. He has joined us today to have a conversation on how to lead with character. Coach Gary Waters spent 11 seasons as the winningest coach in Cleveland State University's program history. As the head coach, he led Cleveland State University to six postseason invitations during his tenure. He also reached the second round of the 2009 NCAA tournament. In 2008, Coach Waters was named the Horizon League Coach of the Year. In addition, all seniors who were in the program during Waters' tenure have graduated with their degree. That's amazing. And the program Program received four consecutive public recognition awards from the NCAA for having an academic performance rate that was in the top 10% nationally. With over two decades of experience in coaching, Waters has seen many changes within the profession over the years and has worked tirelessly to instill a core of values and integrity both on and off the court. And today, Coach has joined us right here on the Unscripted Authentic Leadership Podcast. Coach, thanks for coming on. Oh, I'm excited, Lafayette and John. It's it's it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be exact. Yes, sir. The, absolutely, man. What what a what a bio. What what an achievements that you have achieved. And of course, we could talk about the the sports accolades, and those are amazing. But I think what stuck out to me was the seniors in your program all graduated with degrees. Oftentimes, I think college and athletic sports gets a bad rap, like mm-hmm. Kentucky with a lot of the one and dones. You think, you know, they're not interested in the kids' education and then them getting their degree just there to get them to make the program do well and go to the next level if they are able to do that. But with you, it seems like there was an emphasis there, not only on the sports athletic, but also on the academic side. Can you, can you speak to how you got to uh, those seniors instilled that level of importance of academia into them and how you got it to where all of them graduated with their degrees? Well, you know, they didn't have a choice. You, you go play in this program, you're going to have to get your degree. That's a key factor. But now, but you know what? It, it, it was instilled in me earlier in life. You know, and that's where we do things in our society today because we we gain that knowledge from someone or our parents or someone. And that's exactly what happened here. And what what I had learned, so I came up during the time, you know, I'm one of the old schoolers. I came up where you had to teach and coach at the same time. You know, you couldn't just be a, a coach on a on a collegiate team without being a teacher as well or or in high school. And now in high school, it's still the same. So, you know, I believed in education even before education was a part of it. And then, uh, you know, when I got my degree, I came back and I worked in psychology, education, whole thing. So all that was important to me. And I wanted to instill that in our players. You know, I give you an example. One thing we used to do, which I thought was paramount in our success, is that I taught them a class called success class. And the whole purpose of the class, you didn't get a grade for it or any of that magnitude. What you did is we just sat down, met once a week. And our whole objective was to 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 teach success to them, the importance of success. And I had and I and the whole key to it was for them to define success for themselves. Don't let the world do it and don't let the people around do it, because if you do, then you may end up on the opposite end of that thing. And so, you know, each year we would take a book. And we decide on the book we want to use. I mean, we use Tony Dungy's, all kinds of books for these kids to learn. And what we ended up doing is we, we talked them about success. And like my first one was on from John Wooden, Pyramid of Success. And so you got to if you remember anything about that, John Wooden had a pyramid and in the pyramid were blocks. And these blocks led to the point to the point period. And it, and it talked about how you got you keep moving, you keep moving and you be successful. So what I did with our kids is I had them build a pyramid themselves. I mean, we got we had blocks and everything and they had to put their they had their own individual block that they had to add to it. And it had to relate to success. And they ended up doing that. And uh, and I, it just turned out very good. But let me tell you the uniqueness about it. 
we uh, we during that first season, I said, let's uh, let's come up with a way we can be successful this year. You you decided, players. You tell me what you want. And and they came up with the idea they wanted to win Senior Day game. Okay, now that, that doesn't still sound like very much, but at this school they hadn't won Senior Day game in eight nine years. So every year that you had a Senior Day game, parents come out, everybody's happy, and they lose, go home, feel sad again. So, <laughs> so what we ended up doing is we we said, okay, we're gonna work on that. Now that was my first year there, and those players weren't very good. I mean, you know, it just it, it was it was what it was. But what but when, when and we didn't have a great year that year, but every time something happened, I'd say, hey, that's not our goal. Our goal is to win senior day game. We got to senior day game, and I mean they were excited and everything, and we played the number two team in the conference. We ended up just beat them by, I think, about 15 points. Those kids were so happy. They were jumping up on tables like they didn't want a national championship. They were jumping. They were excited. And I said, man, this is what seen, this is what success class is all about. However, let's take it a step further. Those young men that, had, that ended up having that success during that period of time ended up being our biggest money givers in our program. So they really gained from that experience. So it was brought full circle then. <laughs> yeah. Everything yeah. that you put in them, it came back full circle. You reap what you sow. That's literally. right. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Go ahead, bro. That's amazing that you helped them to find their own success. But what's even better is you kept them from getting off track. Yes. My son yes. wrestles. And uh, this past year was his first full year because he started during COVID of wrestling. So he made goals going into it. And one of them was to place in this regional tournament, placing first through third. And in a second match, he lost. And the thing is, once you lose, you go to a loser's bracket. And now you can only get third place as long as you win all the rest of your matches. And I said, he was kind of like, oh, this stinks. And I said, buddy, it's okay. You're still in. Your goal was to place. One through three is placing. You can't get one and two, but you can still get three. You just can't make any more mistakes. <laughs> and so he went the rest of the day. He won every match and he oh, got third man, place. He's, he was, he's 10 years old and he came running off the mat, jumped up into my arms, arms in the air, like some kind of Rocky movie. And he thought he won the whole tournament because he hit his goal. That's what he That's wanted right. was right. to play. Because the year before he only won one match. He just got his butt kicked for a whole year. And so it was really cool. So, well, but I'm telling you, John, you're teaching him a, a great thing there. That you gotta, you gotta compete, and you may not be successful, but you gotta keep fighting. You gotta mm-hmm. keep being strong at what you do. You know, I, I I got my second book that I just finished, and it's probably be out in a year. It's called Coaching Millennials from a Character Perspective, mm-hmm. and I'm talking about millennials and trying to, and about character. And and when I talk, when I wrote this, you know, I had to I had to research the whole area of generations, not just, you know, the generation that included the, the millennials generations go back. I mean, we went all the way back to industrial age, baby boomers everywhere to see how did the millennials get to this point in their behavior. And so uh, one of the things I, I, you know, you know, you identified in there with the, with the millennials is about uh, uh, success. And, and one of the success is it didn't matter if you succeeded, you got a trophy anyway. Mm-hmm. And so right participation <laughs> trophies <laughs> yeah. and you know we didn't grow up that way if you lost you lost and you're pissed for forever <laughs> when you lose right. and now all of a sudden the kids are you know getting getting uh, rewarded for not for not achieving and 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 that's not the real world and that's what you know in, in this book i define some of that and how important that is is that they face these type of things how did you how does um one cool thing you said, though, was that you kept your team focused on that goal, which was senior night. And I'm sure every year you redefined success for that season with the team did. And then they had, there was always something, an early loss or a player injured that was a key player, something that could derail the thought process of achieving that goal. How did you, as the leader or a leader on the team, help that team stay focused on the goal? Well, the first thing we had to do is allow them to decide on the goal. Because mm-hmm. we could, you know, think about coaches do this all night and day, and they just said, hey, we want to win a championship. Yeah. Half the kids in the program don't even care about winning a championship. They're just happy to be out there on the floor. 
And so we and we all had to agree to it. And I think you have to do that when you bring a, a, a bunch of young men together and they're trying to reach an ultimate goal. And so and, and in order to do that, we have to have in what I call intermingle type moments where they, they, they are defined through what's going on during that time period. And so when they when they hit these moments, they know, well, we're on track toward our goal. And if and if they don't hit them, they, they look at it and say, hey, we got to we got to keep working and find something else to, to move us closer there. Because like you said, you can become derailed and lose and, and things happen like with your son. And then all of a sudden they're ready to quit. And, and, and in our society today with these young men and women that they can't quit because, you know, if they quit, all they're going to do is quit again. And, it, and it's not going to help them move forward. And that's why we we try to teach that you got to stay committed to the goal. Coach, a lot of what you're talking about is alluding to the character of the individual. Oh, you yes. wrote a you wrote a book. I know you just mentioned you wrote your second book. You wrote a first book uh, entitled "The Ten Principles of a Character Coach." Now, there's a lot in just in that title alone, but I want to start with what do you mean by character coach, and how you de- define how do you define character? Well, if you don't mind, I, let, let me give you this. Sure. Uh, I have a definition that I use, and the uh, character coach is actually a person that strives to achieve high moral and ethical values in every area of their lives without compromise. Mm. Now, mm. you hear there's a key word in there, strive, because you may not reach the goal immediately, so you've got to keep working at it. And then you're, sure. go, you're going to make mistakes because we're human. We're going to make mistakes. But the key is keep striving toward achieving that goal, and, and but don't get – don't get compromised in the process because there are going to be many things try to step in the way to, to compromise you. And, uh, and when I first, just to give you an idea why I wrote this book, uh, I first day in retirement, I said, what am I going to do? You know, I'm, I'm retired. What we go? My wife looking. So, well, you got to do something because you just can't, you haven't been around here all this time. And all of a sudden you're ready, you're here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what I said is I'm a, I'm a right. And that's one of the things I did. And, but I needed to have something I wanted to write about. And during that time, uh, college basketball was going through some scandals, some issues. Mm-hmm. And when I seen that, I said, man, this is what we're about. You know, we're really struggling. So I said, how can I help? That was the question I asked myself. How can I help? And that, that I said, I can give them words and encouragement and information to help them move forward. So I started this book. Now, when I started, I said, you know, I got to go back to what this is all about. So I went back to Naismith, who, mm. who invented basketball. And this is in my book, and it says, Naismith believed that if you elected to be a coach, it was also your responsibility to be an advisor, a counselor, a father figure, and to act at all times as an example to the athletes in your care. He also envisioned that sport should develop character, foster patriotism, and instill ethical values that would serve participants well in later life. And when I read that, I said, are we really, really doing this? And this is what he meant. Now, he said this in 1891. Now, think about this. And this is what he thought the sport should be. And I said, we're not even close to that in some of these places. So that's why I wrote this book. So what are some of the you talk, you talk, I know you mentioned 10 character principles. Can you give us a couple impo- like key ones that are important? I know they're all important, but obviously if, we, if someone wants to get all 10, I highly recommend that they invest in the book to invest yeah. in themselves. Yeah. But I would agree you, with that too, John. Yes. So can we can we talk about a couple of them though? To- oh, yeah. Yeah. And you know, the first one, and, and Lafayette, you'll like this. The first one, first principle is God over everything. Put God first in your life. And, and if you do, you don't get caught up in yourself and you don't and, and you don't you don't start doing things you shouldn't be doing. And that's the whole whole gist of that chapter. I'm talking about that. And I use examples and everything in it. Um, the, the second principle and I, I'll just go through them so you get an idea quickly. The okay. second one is and then we'll talk about the ones you feel are good. Second one is improve yourself and others. And each and every day you try to see if you're improving yourself, but you're improving others. The third is live with integrity and honesty. And that's it says it says what it says. Do the right thing and believe in the right thing. 
uh, principle four, treat others the way you want to be treated. And that's basically respect. And the whole process is about respect. And then five principle is the one I, I really like this one. It's called love unconditionally. And then when I when I wrote it in there, everybody said, well, well why you got that in there? And I said, because I have players sometimes that come without a, with a father figure in their, in their lives. And so I have to be an example for them. And I have to show them every day how life should be lived. And if and if I show the love with, and compassion toward my family, my wife, my children, someday when they grow up and they decide to have, have a family, they have, they have a pattern to follow. And that was my whole purpose for that. Uh, principle six, work hard at what matters. Okay, in our society today, we're not working as hard as we used to. Uh, principle seven, value loyalty. It's something that we're struggling with today. Value loyalty. Number eight, empower and serve and serve others. Empower and serve others. The people that work under you, empower them to be the very best they can be. And then serve them so they can reach their goals and objectives. Uh, principle nine, honor the profession. Now, I put that in there because of all the things that were going on. And, and, and the biggest statement I got in here is don't cheat the profession because you are the example in the profession. And then the principle 10 is leave a character legacy. You know, when you leave this earth, what are they talking about? Are they talking about you've done good things to help people? you a uh, loving husband, loving father. Or are they talking about, oh, he won 50 games and he's, uh, you know, he won this championship. Is that all they're talking about? Then yeah. you, you, you decide if you're moving in the right direction. Those were all 10 amazing principles. And I'm, I know John will have his his ones that he wants to pick out. Hopefully I don't pick the one he's going to uh, <laughs> to pick. But I want to tap into that one you said about valuing loyalty. Because oh. as a millennial, you, a millennial, you talk about millennials. I'm a millennial. John is a millennial. Oh, yeah. We, we have lost. We don't really know what that is in my generation. A lot of people. Um, because we're only loyal until something else better comes along. Right, that, or what we deem is better, or the grass looks green on the other side when really it's only greener because it's fake. We don't know that until we get to the other side, right? And and so, how do we just speak to my generation, those that are in their twenties and the thirties, and working professionals, and we're in this fast-paced environment that we've lost the art and value. I like how you stated it, the value of loyalty and being valued and sticking to that that loyalty, whether that be in friendship or your career or whatever that may be, really getting back to the art of valuing loyalty. Can you speak more to that? Yes, yes. You know, loyalty is so key in our society. Now, what I have done in this book, I, I'm talking about the, the the individual principle, but I'm relating it to a time and date. And the time and date I'm relating here and what went on was when I was at Cleveland State. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and so a lot of people that would see this, that's the basketball metaphor involved in it. OK, but when you talk about loyalty, it's so big and it's it's uh, it's so important because uh, that commitment you make to someone is, is vital in in, 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 in and I call it an obligation to someone or something. And if you don't have that, then you don't you don't stay in it very long. Think about our marriages. You know, I, I, I give you an example. I was in I was in Paris, France one time and my wife and I, we were, we were, we were at a, a little cafe. We were eating. And, and, and then when we got there, there were some people already in there eating. And, and I, I just struck up a conversation with the guy and I said, uh, how long you guys been in here? They said, well, we've been in here two hours. And I said, two hours? You've been in here two hours eating, huh? He said, yeah, we'll probably stay another hour, hour and a half. I said, whoa, whoa, don't you got something else you got to do or what's going on? They said, they said, no, no, this is what we do. We sit down, we relate to each other and we sit and just eat and, 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 and fellowship with one another. And I said, and I said, well, that's actually pretty good. I said, and, and you should take that. And he said to me, you should take that home because you'll have less divorces if you take that home. <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> that is. Go ahead, John. Wow, I think that commitment to loyalty yeah. helps extend or helps enrich relationships or commitments through the tough times. Oh, because yes. so often and so easily we will um, – you look at colleges right now with the transfer portal. And I'm not necessarily, necessarily against the transfer portal. I don't think. It's new. I haven't made my opinion. But it's so easy now to say – 
I'm not starting here, transferring here. Okay, that's fine. Maybe maybe someone just with more talent was put in place there or whatever. But that same feeling goes into, so I I met my wife in high school. And so many people like to say, um, hey, it's so amazing that you found you all found each other in your high school. I wish I would have happened to me. I feel like it would have been so much easier. And I used to just say, yeah, maybe. And then one day I started thinking, I think it's harder because when I was 17 and we started dating, I'm now 38 and we have both changed multiple times over the last 21 years. And so it takes a lot more commitment to adjust to the other person's change. We don't even look the same. I'm heavier than I used to be (laughs) all the things, right? I'm probably a little more rigid than I was when I was 17, all the, the, all the stuff. And so the same thing, though, I feel it goes with just leadership in general. How would you? How does that um, commitment to loyalty to you? How do you? How does that go? Um, how do you use that within building your group or your team to help them stay committed to the process, committed towards the goal, without wanting to just jump to the next winning group? Good well, question. you hit it. You hit it all, John, because that's why I wrote that chapter in there. You know, I'm t- I was talking about other things, but I wrote the chapter. And when you read it, you'll see that in there because what occurs is you get you get players that come to you and they're, and you know they you have the portal now, but I knew the portal was about to happen because I was on the board of the NABC, and when and being on that board, I realized that there were certain things going on. And, and at that time, and this was about uh, uh, 2017, uh, 2016, we were considered the poster child for the fifth year transfer, our program. We had, we were having a lot of success. And what would happen is the major schools would come in, pluck our best players away because they had, and, and I did it as a goal for our players. What I did was, you know, some of them that either redshirted or something happened, you know, my goal was to move them forward in their lives so they could be working on their masters, they get their degree, but they still would have some time left to play. Now they were using it against us saying, hey, oh, you can leave anytime you want once you graduate and go to another school. And, and, and that's where the loyalty comes in because you put all that time and energy into that player and you want that player to say, okay, you know, yeah, I can go there and and, and in my mind think I'm going to do something better, meaning uh, have success and go to the pros, but it doesn't always work out that way. It it can turn out to be a bad situation. And I've had a couple of guys where that happened and we've talked about it afterwards because see, I don't change the relationship. Once we start the relationship, it's, it's for a lifetime. So, and I stay committed to them. Even though, you know, they make mistakes. And, and, and I'm telling you, and, and this goes back to what I told you about my new book. One of the issues in the new book you find is the parents. The parents are different today than they were yesterday. And, and, and they'll, they'll jump ship in a minute on you because they feel the, the grass is greener on the other side. And, it, and if things don't work out the right way you want it or something, they're ready to leave. And they don't realize there's more to it than just playing basketball. You know, the whole thing is is growing and developing and maturing and someone pouring into you to make you the very best you can become. And if you don't have that person doing that, it's all about basketball, then that's all you're going to receive. I think it also speaks to the difference between somebody who will look in the mirror and say, <laughs> yes, it's some, maybe there's something I need to improve on mm-hmm. versus always saying it's the coach, it's the team, <laughs> it's right. whatever. That player's favorited. Yeah, I saw it with a Ohio State quarterback who was drafted early, sat for a couple of years, then went to Florida, and then I think he just went to another school again. Oh, yes. And yes. I don't Very remember his good last good name, man. Ewers or something like that. Anyways, um, he was a stud in high school, sat, sat. Now he's somewhere else. What At what point can somebody sit down and say, hey, it's not the school. It's not the <laughs> player's fault. You need to sit down and evaluate – what is going on with you to be successful? I mean, you've already been successful. You were a killer high school quarterback, and you've been on the bench for some amazing schools. Mm-hmm. 90% of athletes, 99% of athletes will never sit on Ohio State's bench. And so, to yeah, me, yeah. that is a success, right? right because maybe right. he thought, oh, I thought I would be, you know, round one in the 2023 draft, and obviously it probably won't happen. Well, you know, with that whole thing, scenario you just talked about there, that's one of our biggest issues today in our society. And when they brought out the portal, 
which I think is, uh, you don't want to know how I feel about that. I think it's going to make the game really tough. And then the NIL, I mean, now that's going to another level. And so everything is about what I say, the financial side instead of the human side of helping this person be successful. And, and what's so bad about this is with the NLI is that they're not, they're not, they're not prepared for this. The players aren't prepared for this. The schools aren't prepared for this. And the NCAA wasn't prepared for this. And so now it has hit us and everybody's in a shamble. And they don't realize, they don't know the aftermath that could happen after this. You know, think about it. One player on the team making all this money and nobody else making anything. And everybody's looking at that person. And they're saying, and he's getting to do what he want to do. Man, that's that's totally counter to, to, to the team concept. Uh, that's a good point. I, I had a... Different perspective on that. I hadn't heard that perspective on the NLI situation. We'll have to talk about that another time. But that's 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 really good. <laughs> well, now uh, I, I think when you look at this whole thing, you yeah. know what they they're trying to correct the problem that's been on for many many years, and I understand. Right. And, right. and 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 I, and I think it's going to be hard to do something now. The, the what do you call right. it? The the cat is out of the hat or whatever. It's out right. now. I mean, you you got now you're gonna have to deal with this. And the <laughs> NCAA is a big struggle for them right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Coach. We we have a uh, and let John. Did you have any more questions for Coach before I give him the last segment? We have a uh, we wrap up our show with the last segment called Off Script, okay. where you leave our audience with whatever's on your heart. It could be something related to the topic or. Whatever you feel left, feel led to leave our audience. Give our audience whatever's on your heart's coach that you want to leave them with your last word in this off screen. Okay. Okay. You know, uh, one of the things I have thought about, and, and, and I kind of wrote this in my other book, I said, uh, you don't have to live, you don't have to lose to learn. And in our society today, everything is about winning, you know, and that's it's, it's so valuable to everyone. But I wrote that in there because in, in the, within the generations, they're they're making mistakes in life because they're the, when they lose, they don't they don't understand why they lost. And then I said in, in the message, you don't have to lose to learn. So you don't have to lose if you listen to others, if you listen to wisdom, people trying to tell you the right way to go and the right things to do. And that's where character comes in then you won't make that mistake later on in your life or immediately in your life. And that's, if I can give someone that, I think that's very, very important. Listen to the wisdom out there from, from the different generations, different people that are telling you to try to help you be the best person you can be. Listen, this has been an amazing conversation. <laughs> we want you all to go pick up Coach Gary Waters' book, 10 Principles of a Character Coach. Uh, wherever you can get your hands on that book, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to read about those 10 principles and apply that to my life. And as what I love about it, those principles are transferable, as you said, beyond sports. Those are life principles that you can take with you on your daily journey. Thank you again, Coach Waters, for coming on and having this amazing conversation with us on how to lead with character. To our audience and those that may be listening, stay connected here with us on Unscripted. You can join our Patreon family, support our mission here at patreon.com backslash Unscripted Leadership. You can follow us on all social media platforms at Unscripted Leadership, unscripted-leadership.com. And of course, you can get this podcast wherever you get your podcast available on all streaming platforms. Thank you, Coach Gary Warners. Those of you that are listening, as always, we pray that you be the leader that God has called you to be. We're here to build bridges and not walls. Bridges connect and walls divide. Until next time, God bless you. <laughs>